So this is a very recently put together talk. Uh, I wasn't sure whether I'm going to give an introduction to normalizing flow or recent uh, talk about recent advances in normalizing flows. Um, so it's going to be the recent advances. So I had to make a change this morning to the talk, um, as you see. Yeah, so who am I? Uh, quickly, uh, so I'm a bioinformatician. I studied in Munich. Um, and did my PhD in Tübingen at the Max Planck Institute uh, on genome dissociation studies. So the title is Linear Mixed Models for Genome Dissociation Studies. And I spent some time here in LA, where I was at Microsoft Research uh, in an office yeah, right uh, off of campus, 1100 Glendon Avenue. Um, there's a good coffee store on the other side, Profeta. Um, I uh, in 2015, I moved to uh, Mountain View um, to Human Longevity Inc., which is a company by Craig Venter. And uh, in 2017, I moved back to academia. So I went to um, Berlin, where I became a group leader at the Max Delbrück Center. And now I'm a professor at the Hasso Plattner Institute in, in Potsdam. Mm, yeah, I'm doing machine learning. So digital health and machine learning is uh, we're working a lot on. Um, methods development uh, for medical imaging, genetics, and uh, you know you, we use a lot of data from biobanks. Right uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, normalizing flows. So normalizing flows are a generative models. So um, just so you know, like discriminative models they uh, you know discriminate between points, and generative models um, so they're basically modeling a conditional distribution. Well, it's this generative models, they, they model the, the distribution of, of uh, the data itself. Um, and yeah, so the way they always work, can everybody see this? Because it might be behind the, okay, so that might be an issue because my slides are always quite full. <laughs> All right. Um, but they always work in the following way, pretty much, that um, you basically what you're interested in is modeling the distribution of your data x. And um, they, they do that by yeah, modeling actually like a simpler distribution z of some latent variable. And um, then basically model x based on, you know, like uh, basically the dependency between, between the simple variable and the more complex variable, um, data variable, which might be images or something else, uh, like a number of phenotypes or so, um, using you know some complex functions that model, model conditional distributions, and you basically the, you can use the conditional distribution of p of x given z in order to, for example, generate an image, or if you want to do an inference, you want to go the other way. That's uh, p of z given uh, given x. Mm -hmm. So typically people know about GANs and they know about variational uh, autoencoders, but they don't know very much about um, uh, flow-based models. Um, so they, but they, as you see, you see, basically they all pretty much do the same thing as always this simple Z and the, the, the data X. Um, and there's usually like some encoder that goes from X to Z and there's a decoder that goes from Z to um, X. Um, so these two models, they, they introduce a bottleneck. So the, the distribution, there's basically some information loss um, from X to Z, so compression. Um, flows, they do this differently. They're basically, uh, they work with, uh, in this case, the, the encoder and the decoder are basically inverses of each other. So there's no, no loss. It's really an invertible function that you're modeling. And because of that, um, you can actually um, they, 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 they enable to do something which these others don't. Here we always have to somehow approximate something. For example, um, instead of, you know, like uh, working with the likelihood uh, or the log likelihood of our data, we have to um, uh, work with a lower bound of that log likelihood and maximize this, this evidence lower bound. Um, but for, for flows, we can really just work with the log likelihood and, and you know learn the parameters of these um, these functions here um, by maximizing the log likelihood. It's a really short question. Yeah. If you have f and f inverse, you get back if x by definition. Yes. So x prime is x. There's no log likelihood to function. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> um, so what are they? Well, as we already said, they are generative models. Uh, they're invertible. And um, the nice thing is that they are basically capable of normalizing an unknown distribution um, by you know, transferring it into a simple distribution that, that usually is a Gaussian distribution. Um, so GANs are not probabilistic, but they basically do the same thing. So these are probabilistic. And VIEs, which are also probabilistic, they um, maximize this lower bound, where here we can really um, work with uh, the, the, the likelihood, the data likelihood itself. And yeah, that's basically what they do here. Um, they, we have our complicated data distribution. Um, um, and we basically use a series of transformations in order to get to, to a simple distribution. And all of these transformations, they are invertible, so we can go back and forth. Yeah. Um, so one thing that we can, can do with this is, for example, density estimation, um, where we observe some data x and um, um, that come from some probability distri distribution p of x, and we want to um, I basically get p of x um, for um, with this. For example, we could do anomaly detection, so we can take some arbitrary data and uh, you know fit some probability distribution to it, um, and then ask whether, for example, a new data point comes is likely to come from this data set or not. And that is really hard if you cannot. If you don't have access to the likelihood, because it's very hard. Uh, so if you, if you, for example, work with something that is only proportional to the likelihood, you never know, you, like uh, what scale your epsilon should have, right? <laughs> um, it's your threshold when you whether you accept something or not. But whereas here, you can really say, okay, this is this is a low probability um, sample. Alternatively, you might want to generate uh, artificial data. Um, so you again have your data that comes from some distribution, and, and here the idea might be to generate a new data point um, from the same distribution, uh, which typically is used, for example, in, in, in to, to do data set augmentation, uh, but also to do latent space manipulation, where you um, want to modif basically generate some, some samples that have uh, particular properties, um, or you want to uh, interpolate between samples and so on. Um, or you just want to generate additional samples for some arbitrary um, thing. And I'm sure many have seen in the context of, of GANs usually, um, and, and um, these, these uh, face, faces that are generated by some neural networks, these are actually faces that are generated by a normalizing flow. Uh, that's the GLOW model. Uh, you can see that they're not, like the quality is not as good as, as, as uh, the state of the art would be for um, like a style gun or, um, something like that. Uh, yeah, so, so the normalizing flows don't only have advantages, they also have the drawbacks. Um, but they, um, the nice thing is that you get the likelihood. Um, how do they work? Well, they do a probabilistic change of variables. Um, and uh, let's look at a simple example to see how this works. So this is the intro part. <laughs> So say we have uh, a function f of x, and it's, uh, so that computes some y, which is 2x plus 1. Um, and let's say that, that x is uniformly distributed. Um, then we basically have to go from, if you're interested now in the distribution of, um, of y, then we have to look at the transformation, and you see that basically the, the space is spread out. Um, and uh, now the new distribution will also be uniformly distributed, but um, the, the, the density at each point is only half. So we, are sort of, we have to divide by this two here yeah, in order to get, uh, again, to a normalized distribution. So the probability density needs to be stretched to cover the support of the new transformation. Um, So, and normal, normalizing flows do exactly that. And uh, let's look at the simple 1D case. Um, so say uh, we have some uh, standard normally distributed data, um, which is pretty much the most simple thing that we can do. And then we define an, 
um, affine f a transformation of this x, which might be a forward pass, uh, considered a forward pass in our normalizing flow. So this would be, so our flow, our invertible function would be basically that we add some mu to it and we multiply by um, a sigma. And the, converted, like the, the, the corresponding inverse uh, would be this transformation, which uh, given some x gives us epsilon back. So we um, have to first um, uh, subtract uh, mu and then divide by sigma. And thus, Starting with our P of E, we want to find our P of X. Um, so P of E is, is our standard normal. Um, so this is what we're doing. We have our P of E and we're transforming it to get P of X. And again, what you see is that the, the interval uh, somehow might change, but, um, instead, but, but of course the probabilities that we assign to these intervals should, should stay the same. Um, and uh, a necessary condition for this is that um, if you look at the, 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 the product of um, the, the density and um, a delta and E, and that should be the same as P of X uh, delta and X. And how do we get this? Well, just by um, dividing this and um, uh, dividing by, by um, by these things, so and the resulting term. Um, so in this case, we have x equals mu plus uh, e sigma. So, so if we um, divide by uh, the ratio of these, we basically get this uh, absolute value. Uh, divide by the absolute value of the x de. So the the which is basically the um, Jacobian between um, of, of this function. And then we get our corresponding um, p of um, uh, p of x back as p of e divided by sigma. And what this corresponds to is really this models the change of volume here. So it's um, if you if you would do this again with uh, the uh, the same same density here, and you just moved it by by mu, um, this would be too low. So we have to because, um, so yeah. I, I, I would guess that probably 90% uh, of the audience is completely lost. Really? Yeah. You can ask them. This is uh, calculus. calculus, exactly. Yeah. This is. Uh, no, no, but I guess what this is your trend, but maybe explain how this relates to the normal, what you talked before. This is your, okay. your transform function. So, so my transform function is basically adding mu and multiplying by sigma. That's, that's my transform. That's my normalizing flow here, that's, which is a very simple example of normalizing flow. It's an affine flow, right? Yeah. So just to understand this, this whole principle, you have like a set of transformation that happens over, I don't know, over certain layers. Yes. How does the architecture work? Do you define like uh, this transformation function at each layer? And like how do you define it? Or what kind of training happens? Right. So the the question was, um, how do these functions have to look like that, such that we can apply them layer wise and so on? And we will get to that. Uh, but the properties need to be that they need to be invertible, and that we need uh, to be able to compute this term, which is um, well the the absolute value of the determinant of the Jacobian, which will come to in the, in the typically in the in the normalizing flow case, in the neural network case, we are, we are not dealing with a single uh, constant, but we want to, um, we have vectors, so we basically want to take ve one vector that is n-dimensional and transform it to another vector. So the Jacobian is actually then a matrix, um, and this change in volume is then given by the, um, by the, by the determinant of the, of the Jacobian matrix. Uh, but I will, let, let me go to this. So this is basically just the derivative d of x, de in this case, um, which is, uh, is just sigma. Yeah? So this is basically saying, how does uh, x change if I change e? And 
And yeah, if we want to go back and basically compute the density um, at a point x, then we can um, apply the, the inverse transform. So th those are basically the ingredients in 1D. We need to have a function, we, have, we need to have the inver uh, inverse of this function, and we need the derivative, basically. This, uh, like how, how does it change? The change of variables in calculus, right? I mean, it's nothing more. Um, and the resulting likelihood, we can just compute it. Uh, in this case, we have transformed the standard normal distribution using this uh, linear normalizing flow <laughs> into a, uh, you know, the general um, normal distribution. Okay, so far we have worked with scalars. Let's uh, now get to the interesting case where um, we actually want to deal with vectors. So, um, so we now have an n-dimensional vector z. Um, and this is a random variable with ha which has a simple probability density. So again, can, is typically then the, the standard, the, the, the multivariate normal. And we have um, our function f of z, which goes from Rn again to Rn. You see that the dimensionality stays the same. So there's no, that's why there's no bottleneck because it needs to be invertible. So typically, if you want to achieve invertible and we don't want to make additional assumptions, um, the dimensionality needs to, uh, to be the same. Um, and that gives us, so if you apply this, uh, to, to z, we get uh, z n plus, r, n plus 1, um, which is a transformation of this uh, original random variable. Okay, so this yeah. n and this n are the same, right? Be like uh, that's <laughs> correct, yes, sorry, sorry about that. Yeah, there's an, sorry about the indexes, uh, this was thrown together like uh, yesterday. So this is okay. iteration. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So this should be um, layer n plus uh, basically the, the, the n plus one first representation in the normalizing flow. Um, but um, we again need to um, basically follow the, the change of variable in the uh, probability de density. And in this case, uh, instead of the absolute value of uh, before we had the absolute value of the uh, of the derivative. Now we have an absolute value again of the determinant of the so-called Jacobian matrix. Um, so this is the determinant that, um, and what is the Jacobian matrix? Uh, in this case, we have a function that goes from Rn to Rn. So this is a matrix that has all the partial derivatives. Basically, how does the ith input change into the ith output? Yeah, and that's, so basically you have the D of um, the ith input with respect to the ith output. Um, um, so that's, that gives you an n by n matrix. And if you compute the determinant of this matrix, so, so it needs to be full rank, otherwise the determinant is zero. Um, so we need, uh, and, and this is basically the condition that this, this is also then in, uh, invertible in this case. Um, and that gives us exactly this, um, if we go back to this example, basically this difference between, so such that basically if we, the, the condition that this um, volume uh, stays the same. Questions? No? Okay. Um, and now we can basically uh, put this uh, into a chain rule by stacking multiple of these, uh, of these mappings after each other. So we start out by um, our original z0, which is, um, for example, an image. And then we start transforming it, right? That comes from our original probability distribution. And sort of layer by layer, we apply these invertible functions in, in order to create uh, some uh, set n. Uh, or actually, no, this would be the latent variable, and this would be our image, sorry. So we basically go the forward pass from the, the simple distribution to the more complex one. And um, for each of those steps, we basically now uh, compute the, um, the determinant. And what, what happens is that if uh, what you basically get is you always have to divide, or you have to always multiply by the inverse of this absolute value of the determinant. And as a result, basically you get one determinant from each of those uh, layers. Um, so you get a product of all of these determinants. That's 
uh, actually quite simple. So our our new probability distribution, so the probability of, of uh, Zn is equal to the probability of Z0, or simple one, times the product of these uh, determinants. And well, in practice, we don't want to uh, compute the product of, uh, of many um, numbers, but we rather want to um, sum logs, um, otherwise, uh, we, we get numerical issues, so, so we always want to work in logs. And uh, the product, basically the, the log um, of a product is, is a sum. Yeah. yeah, so that's that's already the introduction. Now you know everything about uh, normalizing flows. Uh, the unknowns are, how do we get this fu these, these functions, right, um, that enable us this. And, uh, that is sort of the sort of the, the trickery now of um, of working on normalizing flows, basically by coming up with recipes that uh, give you these invertible functions. So it needs to be invertible, and we need to be able to compute analytically the, the or efficiently um, the the, the uh, determinant of the Jacobian. So let's recall um, the difference between inference and generation. Um, so in one case. We have our data, and we so that's basically um, going from the, the the data to the latent space, where basically we, we use this series of transformations to take our complex data uh, in order to make it so, for example, um, um, just standard normal distributed. Or in the other way, we basically transform um, our standard normal distribution. Uh, to come to our data space, and in one case uh, we use these functions, and otherwise we use the inverse of these functions. So in this example, the dimension is two. Yes. Each point is an observation, not the entire image. Is Each point is an observation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. How do we add these steps? Um, so a use case might be to. Um, so I give you a data set of 1,000 images and ask you to model the probability distribution of these images, which is a really complex task. Um, um, so, or I give you um, some arbitrarily distributed uh, high dimensional data and uh, ask you to, to estimate the, the, the probability distribution of this data, or basically model the probability distribution um, for yeah, for example, to do some downstream analysis, stuff. yeah, like a GWAS or whatever, yeah. This kind of contradicts the intuition of uh, all these deep learning on images I ever heard, which is that there is complex low dimensional structure, and so the, the, the existence of bottlenecks is critical for, and, and your, your thing, I mean, this stuff, not your stuff, this stuff keeps the dimension fixed. Yeah. Uh, just, okay. So you're still going to tell us about how you learn the transformations and maybe... I'll, I'll give you an example now of, um, of one way to do this, and that's the coupling layer. Um, so the coupling layer does the following. Um, so you have your, your inputs to the layer, which are the x's, and the outputs to the layer, which are the y's. Um, so you have, say, n of these x's, basically n dimensions of, 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 of x. This is just a vector that we want to transform into an n-dimensional vector y. Now we distribute, uh, basically divide x into two sets, so say of n half each. Yeah? And now we um, have two neural networks, uh, one that, go, that we call s and the other one is t. And uh, those two networks that have as an output also an n, n half dimensional vector, but they are arbitrary nonlinear um, neural networks. And now we are, we are uh, creating uh, the output where we basically just copy over x1, so this stays untransformed. And then on the other side, we take our output of this neural network and we multiply it with x2, and we add the output of the second neural network to get a transformed uh, um, x2. So basically the input is x1 and x2, the output would be just copying over x1 and using x1 to, to transform x2. And then in the next layer, we would basically switch them. 
uh, such that one would transform the other. So in that case, over multiple layers, we transform everything in a nonlinear fashion. Yeah? Um, and uh, the inverse is easily computable because what we need to do is we, we basically um, um, we compute uh, T and S again, which we can because um, this stays unchanged. Um, and thus we first uh, subtract T again and then we divide. So basically subtract T and then we divide by S and get X2 back. And that is our inverse. Yeah? Everybody agrees that this is a, the inverse of the same function? Yes. Yeah, it's very easy to compute. And this is not learned. T and S are learned. They have parameters that are learned. They can be arbitrarily learned uh, using, by maximizing the log likelihood. So which log likelihood? You have invertible functions. You're getting back what you put in. What well, you have your training. Hmm? What is the log likelihood here? This is the thing I'm confused about. You have invertible functions. You're getting back what you, go, what you put in. So uh, where is the log likelihood? Yeah, so it's it's the you're basically transforming Z to to your data your, to your data set. So we um, so basically we have to go basically if we um, and Z comes from some simple distribution, and we basically learn these functions such that the if we transform our complex data to the simple distribution, the max, uh, likelihood is maximized. So condition one. Yes, exactly. That's yeah. Usually, usually multivariate normal uh, with is, you know um, identity covariance. Um, yeah. So condition one that we need is that it's easily invertible. So the invertible. This is what I just uh, showed you in this image. The second one is that we can compute the Jacobian. Now the question is, what is the Jacobian? Well. Um, Think of we have two parts. Um, so one is basically going from x1 to y1, and that's uh, the identity. So we have an identity function here for this part, for all of these partial derivatives. Then we have uh, for the other part um, a diagonal matrix uh, because we're basically computing um, just scalar, uh, scalar functions um, of each of those input dimensions. So we have, because we're taking x, we're computing s of that, and then uh, typically the x. Um, so that's a diagonal matrix, and then we have um, some, some also um, basically the, the partial derivatives of, of uh, x1 and x2, um, or uh, um, y2 with, uh, with respect to um, x1. But the problem is we only need, or the, the nice thing is that we only need to compute the determinant of this um, Jacobian and uh, the, the determinant of, uh, of a um, triangular matrix is the product of the diagonals. So we actually don't have to care about this part. So the, the, um, so the only thing that we need to compute is these values, which are just uh, you know, a bunch of ones, and, uh, and then these, which are scalars. And then we have to pr basically compute the product over all of these scalars, or if we work with the logs, we have to, to sum up the logs. Yeah? And that is um, O of n half, where n is our dimension. And uh, yeah, so the, the determinant is just a product over these um, um, dimensions here that, that belong to to these. And uh, sorry for the changes of, of indices all the time. As I said, I threw these uh, slides together just um, uh, the, over the last two days. OK, so these are um, it's a coupling layer. So and there are others. Uh, but this is one example um, that, that is used a lot for in, in, in normalizing flows. Um, there are problems with uh, normalizing flows. Um, one is that they are not robust against certain distribution shifts. Um, the other thing is because uh, uh, you know they, they keep the dimensionality, but you still want to have a high expressivity. So you still want to have the ability to to model um, 
quite uh, nonlinear functions, but keep them invertible. That requires, in practice, a lot of parameters, and that's that's really a, a problem. So this uh, glow uh, architecture that I showed you for these these facial images, for example, uses 45 million parameters to generate 32 by, or model to 32 by 32 images. So it's 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 really uh, a lot. Um, in comparison to Stylegun 3, which makes much nicer in images. Um, only needs a million parameters for, for yeah. Yeah, much fewer parameters. Like, yeah, yeah, much fewer. But they also, um, so the diffusion models are also, they, they, they um, also generate really high fidelity images. Um, but again, you, like they are uh, approximate again, so you don't have access to the, the likelihood, right? They're not invertible. Um, so coupling layers are easy to invert, and the Jacobian is cheap. However, they have very limited expressiveness, so the, 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 uh, these functions, they are not too, uh, too flexible, and they stri really struggle with discontinued densities. Um, for example, here you always see real data sets uh, in 2D that are discontinuous, and you see how, they, um, how poorly they, they are modeled by these um, um, coupling layers. Um, so, Eshan, the PhD student of mine, actually um, wanted to, to address these issues. Uh, so, he had the ideas of, of using basically kernels um, to replace these uh, neural networks, S and T, um, in, in normalizing flows. Um, and, uh, yeah, to, to address some of these, uh, these um, issues. Um, yeah, it's, it's well motivated. I mean, we're already using kernel um, density estimation. Um, they, they are still being used for small data sets. Um, and yeah, also kernels work on, on other um, uh, related uh, tasks quite well, um, especially um, with uh, discontinued densities. So the, uh, the, the resulting um, method is actually quite simple uh, if, you, if you just look at the algorithm. Um, so, so you basically have, again, a coupling layer. Um, but the idea is to, um, to compute this S and T, where S is the scaling and T is the translation, which are um, factors, using, you know, not uh, neural networks, but uh, linear functions in order producing kernel Hilbert space. Uh, like the older ones of you should definitely know what the kernel trick is. The younger ones probably not anymore, because no one talks about uh, kernels anymore. Um, but the idea is basically that you have um, a, that you express your, your algorithm only using uh, inner products. Um, and that allows you to incorporate a very high dimensional feature map into these uh, inner products. So say you have some, some data in 2D and by introducing a feature map that increases the number of dimensions, uh, you can actually um, take something that in the original uh, uh, data space is quite uh, nonlinearly um, embedded. Uh, you can embed it into a higher dimensional space where with linear functions you can model everything. And uh, because of this kernel trick, because we don't have to explicitly compute all of these, uh, these um, uh, basis functions, we can even let the number of basis functions go to infinite. Um, and still get a finite object, which is uh, only this, uh, the, the, the so-called gram matrix um, or the, the kernel matrix. And the idea is, is exactly that, that the resulting algorithm is, is very simple. So you, you uh, have your coupling layer. So you have your XM, which, we want, which is the input to the uh, coupling layer. We uh, divide it into two parts. And then on the one part, we compute basically uh, a kernel matrix and then we um, get S and T, the scaling factors and the, the translation factors, um, by computing a linear function of this kernel matrix, um, which corresponds to uh, this kernel matrix has especially the matrix only of the of the inner products um, between um, this one part of of, of the axis, um, and then we use the resulting S and T to do the transformation as in the coupling layers. 
And um, so one thing that, that, that used to be in every kernel paper back then is a representative theorem. There's also a representative theorem, which I won't talk about today. So the, uh, what this basically says is that, um, yeah, that in the end, um, any linear function can be represented, um, or any object in this, in this higher dimensional space can be computed only based on linear combinations of these, uh, of these uh, inner products, of these kernel values. Um, now, a problem is that um, the, the weight matrix is scaled quadratically with a sample size m. Um, so this works quite well for, for small data sets. It works, it works actually really well for, for small data sets if you use, for example, an RBF kernel, so um, Gaussian kernel. Um, and there's, uh, so we employ also a second trick, which is typically used in, in uh, Gaussian processes, which is using uh, auxiliary points that are also learned. So instead of computing um, uh, basically the inner product of x with itself, uh, we compute x, the inner product of x with these um, auxiliary points, where these are much smaller than the number of data points we had before. Um, yeah, and that, that also works uh, really well for large data sets. Um, it's, let's look at some, some results using this. Um, it uh, performs really well um, on, these, on these 2D distributions. We compare here um, with, with GLOW. Um, you, you see that like, the star is, is really nicely modeled also the while the discontinuous, uh, the discontinuous parts here are not completely away, it looks much better than, than, than what we get for GLOW. And if you look at for these, uh, these two half moons here that are within each other, those are really nicely, nicely modeled here. Um, also on, and these are the, the uh, log likelihoods that we achieve um, on these data sets if you compute an out of sample log likelihood here. So uh, if end, the nice thing is that uh, if you look at the number of parameters that we get, um, they are a fraction of the number of parameters that the GLOW model needs in order to get a better fit to the data. And also on some um, real world data sets, uh, which are from the um, UCI, so, uh, University of California, Irvine has uh, curates this uh, set of, of benchmark data sets. Um, we see that if we compare um, them to other um, models like GLOW with a red line, um, we, we get a um, much cheaper loss uh, much quicker and uh, with a smaller number of parameters at the same time for various uh, data sets. Um, yeah, so log likelihoods out of sample um, work really well <laughs> using this uh, kernelized um, coupling layer compared to other coupling layers. And also other um, models that, that are uh, yeah, um, flow models, uh, different architectures. So that works really well. Um, so are there questions for this uh, part of the talk? Uh, I would like to give a small addition, um, and that is uh, um, a second uh, paper on, on normalizing flows. Um, so any idea what is an issue with these image data sets? So can, um, and we want to model it, what, what is the problem here? So these are the faces in the wild, yeah. Okay, uh, tilted. Well, uh, we can. I guess we can can uh, fix that with the preprocessing algorithm. It's like same person. Same person, multiple times. Oh yes, actually, um, if uh, I think I think George Bush uh, in this in this data set appears like hundreds of times, whereas this other people just appear once. Um, so. Um, the problem here is that we see many people repeated, uh, repeatedly um, and George W. Bush, like really all the time. <laughs> um, 
So, and uh, you know, if we, if we just uh, now model a likelihood, then, then we would um, assume that, that this uh, data are drawn independently from the underlying distribution, from the set of all faces, versus they are not. There are also other applications, for example, in uh, genetics, um, where we might, for example, want to account for some, some dependencies, uh, uh, such as relatedness uh, or so. Um, so, and we basically, the, the goal of this, this work is to come up with a um, normalizing flow model that accounts for dependencies between data sets. So, um, yeah, similarly pro problems uh, where um, dependent data set arises is, for example, if we model spatial temporal data, uh, or if we um, model uh, graphs. So this is again the standard normalizing flow. Um, so we have our invertible neural network, which in this case we call, call T, which goes from one layer to the next. It's invertible and we can compute the, the determinant of it. Um, and that gives us basically our transformed likelihood where our log likelihood, which is the yeah, our original likelihood minus the log determinant. Yeah? And that allows us to take a data set of n data points and uh, maximize the log likelihood uh, to train the parameters of the, um, of the transformation, which is the, the flow, this t. Now, the standard way to do this is to assume that the data is uh, all independently, so our um, likelihood actually becomes sort of the sum of all the log likelihoods. And uh, the idea of this work is uh, to actually just model them dependently. So the way to do that is to reinterpret the normalizing flow um, as a data set wide uh, function. So instead of having a function that you apply n times, you have one function that you apply to all the n samples at once. So basically, the n samples are one input vector, so to say, a very large vector. Um, and where x is the in input and u is the output, so u is uh, the inverse transformation of x, or x is the transformation of u. Um, and uh, so, so in this case, we um, can still apply the transformation theorem in the same way. Um, there are now two terms that we need to handle. The first one is the, uh, the base distribution, log p. Um, and the other one, one is the, the log dead of the Jacobian. Um, uh, this, this is the same as before. The one thing that is different here is the base distribution because it's not an independent distribution anymore. So we have to find a dependent distribution now. Um, and here we make uh, some modeling assumptions. Uh, one is that we have sort of an intra-instance uh, covariance structure. Um, and in this case, we assume that, uh, say, the, the fa if we have faces between two different people, they are independent. Whereas if you have uh, two faces of the same uh, person, for example, they are dependent. So, and uh, that is what we call the inter-instance -in covariance. Um, so that is a... So one is an identity matrix for independence, and the other one is a, is a full covariance. And now um, we model the, um, our latent variable, the base, uh, the space distribution as a matrix normal distribution, which uh, has a row and a column covariance. And one is an identity matrix, and the other one is, a, um, is a, this, this, this full covariance matrix. So, this gives us our updated density, which um, again uh, computes, uh, has the, the log determinant. So the log determinant um, of the identity is, 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 is one, so it, it doesn't appear here. So all we're left with is, is, is the log determinant of C. Um, and um, then the, um, the, the no, basically the, the, the sum of squares, which is given by this trace term. Yeah. So, but as I understand, you assume you have the same number of observations from each uh, cluster. 
to have this uh, semantic structure, and the other thing is you assume C is the same. So the yeah. only thing that makes sense is, is like a fixed, uh, like actually correlated matrix, right? Well, so I mean, you can. What order you get the images for each cluster? I mean, if you, I mean, uh, uh, we also consider the case where we have uh, not the same samples from each instance. Um, so, uh, but then you basically just have the product of the covariances. For example, the, um, for the, the repeated measurements cases, such as the, um, the, the, the images, that would just be uh, a block matrix of ones. Yeah? Yeah. So yeah. Or a single uh, covariance term. That depends on the use case. That, that depends on the use case. Of course, um, here here we consider it to have just a single um, covariance term, uh, basically a single scalar that we actually fit in this in this work. But but this is you know can be easily uh, modified and it just yeah. Um, and you know that works well. Say we have a true distribution. Now we sample somehow um, in a biased way by introducing dependencies. If we now just use uh, the standard normalizing flow to data sample from this, of course, we get um, this, uh, this distribution back and not this. But if we um, account for these dependencies, then we get the, uh, the, the original distribution back. And that's really what we want to achieve. Yeah? So we basically want to uh, um, account for these dependencies. Um, and uh, yeah, we look at several um, of these, uh, these um, different applications. Uh, not going to, to go into detail here. Um, works quite well. The most interesting one is actually uh, an application to, um, um, to GWAS. So say you want to do a uh, multivariate GWAS. Um, so you basically have a number of correlated traits and you want to do a transformation on them. So uh, because they are highly non-normally distributed. Um, now the standard way to do that is to apply a transformation to each of them independently. Um, basically a univariate transformation to map them say to, to um, a standard normal CDF. So just a rank based transformation basically. Um, completely non-parametric. Now the problem with this is um, that this will destroy the, um, the dependence. So if you look at the, the dependences here, by applying these univariate distributions, we, um, uh, these univariate uh, transformations, we actually make them artificially independent. So we're changing the dependence structure. Um, versus if, um, We, if we uh, apply these, um, um, this, this sort of a matrix variant transformation that we learn using a uh, normalizing flow, uh, we keep this. And then that allows us, for example, to do a downstream uh, multivariate uh, genome-wide association studies, uh, which we have also done on um, several example uh, group of traits. In this case, these are um, some uh, biomarkers. Um, and uh, yeah, we find more associations in this case. But um, this is a, so I'm quite excited about uh, this, this uh, joint transformation. Yeah, so with this, I want to um, come to a conclusion. So these are the, the two uh, papers that I talked about. These are uh, the, the students, Eshant and Matthias, who have been do doing the work together in collaboration with uh, Miles Kloft uh, from TU Kaiserslautern. And um, yeah, so the take home message is normalizing flows allow you to learn really interesting uh, data transformation. So that's actually the, the main use case, uh, I would think, uh, in, in genomics is uh, that, they, that you typically want to somehow standardize your data. You want to, um, to learn a transformation. Um, and especially for multivariate transformations that is not easy, or if you want to model something that is typically, uh, you know, like where all the standard non-parametric statistics don't work, uh, you can think of a normalizing flow. Uh, 